Hello, Russell. Delighted to be having a chat with you. Myself and Steve Evans here. Hi, Steve. Hi, Russell. Hi. Nice to see you guys. You Thank okay? you for having me on. And, yeah, it's great. Uh, great to see you. Great to meet you. But uh, just before we start, we get into the. The, the realms of book writing and everything else. I've, um, mm. I was just looking at some of your comments this afternoon on, on Twitter about three hours ago, and I found them really humorous. And I just want to quote a couple of them to you. Uh, oh, yeah. you made me laugh. I don't know if Terry's seen them. No, no. I, I'll I'll you, uh, on your Twitter uh, handle at the top there, you've got a lowly word monkey banging away at one of a billion <laughs> typewriters. <laughs> that's me. I just, I just like that because that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what it is. But then I was looking at another one. You were talking about your son, I think, and you've described him as a playful toddler about as easy to dress as an angry, greased python of meth. <laughs> well, and, if, you, if you have kids, you know, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's, that's the yeah. way it is. Yeah. Oh, I, was, I was so giggling away a few hours ago. Absolutely superb. Anyway, move, moving on. You're in, is... Uh, Cam, uh, is it pronounced Kamloops in British Columbia? Loops, yeah. Right. Um, just explain to us a little bit exactly where that is geography, uh, geographically wise. I'm a bit, I'm not too sure where it is in relation to other states and uh, what side of the America it is on. So, and what's it like there? That's today? Okay. It's sunny. It, um, it's cloudy and dreary, but we live in a beauty. It's a beautiful mountain town, so it's wow. lovely view out the window. The one thing I will say about Kamloops is it's in between. Okay, British Columbia, it's in the center of British Columbia with America down here and Vancouver over here on the left. Right. What Got I would you. say is that it, I'm, I don't blame you for not knowing where it was. When I moved here, I had absolutely no idea where the place <laughs> was when I got off the plane. <laughs> here we are. My yeah, wife, my yeah, wife go on. got her, uh, her dream job here in Kamloops and, okay, if it's a dream job, we're going to go there. Where is it? And neither one of us knew. We had to Google it. So. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Well, as long as you like it there and it's doing what you need to do, you've got jobs there and that's, that's it, isn't it? Good stuff, good stuff. So you're also certainly very well-travelled anyway. You've been, you know, um, Canada, UK, Cambridge. Um, driving tractors in Australia, I'm really interested about, and the battlefields of Europe. Uh, veteran or is that something else again? I, I'm not quite old enough to have fought in Europe, I must admit. But uh... I didn't think so. <laughs> Don't worry about lines but uh i i when i went to cambridge and when i did my degree everything was history and it was 20th century conflicts so i battlefields were my thing learning about world ah, war one right. world war ii korea things like that and i just i spent a couple summers in europe walking around touring these places and just walking where all these big events had happened years ago and it, it just Wonderful summer job, the best thing you could possibly do. Did you look at any uh, of the in further history, like Napoleonic times? Like, for instance, are you interested in the Bernard Cornwell, the Sharp series of books with battlefields scattered Cornwell, throughout yes, France, absolutely. Spain? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, all the Sharp novels. I, I got into yeah. a bunch of those and I've been going through them, but there's just so many of them. I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem with a long series like that is you have no idea where to start. Because hmm. Cornwall started at one point and then he went back further and exactly, further and yeah. further, giving more yeah. backstory. So I have I have no idea where an entry point was. Hmm. I started at the Battle of Waterloo and I went forward and back and forward and back. Yeah. A sort of really accessible thriller. Well, thriller not the right word. Adventure novel that Cornwall hmm. writes. I, I like those a lot. Yeah. He does jump back to the timeline. Like for instance, in you would think in the novels, um, he's, he's a young man in India, you know, he's, he's a private. And yet in the films and the television series, he's an older man going back there. And it is a bit confusing the timeline, but it's a good, good yarn. So what's uh, tra driving tractors in Australia? Was it farm work or? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> My wife works in agriculture. She's a scientist and she got posted to Australia. So she said, well, I've got to be there for the next six months. Um, you can stay here or you can come with me. And I'm not going to spend six months alone. So I went to Australia and uh, they gave me, her employer gave me a job just driving tractors and mulching fields. It's, the, it's probably the lowest, the most low tech thing they can do. I don't trust him with any heavy machinery. Let's just have him go back and forth across the field. And that actually kind of got me into my writing my novel because 
when you're teaching and when you're working during the day, it's, it's very cerebral. It's that part of your brain where you think about lecturing, you think about how you're going to form your, your lesson and tell a story. But when you were just going back and forth across the field, I didn't, that was a different part of my brain entirely. So I got to think more about, okay, well, if I'm, I want to write a novel. I've always wanted to write a novel. What would it be about? How would I do this? And just tumbling back and forth <laughs> doing this all day. Um, I would do the work in the field in the morning. I would get home and I would write for a couple hours in the evening. And that's what got me into this. Okay. You know, before we talk more, well, with our main focus on your writing, what, what do you do for hobbies, for pastimes? Are you still teaching? Not teaching as much as I'd like. Uh, here in BC, there's different teaching rules as well. So um, I'll do lectures. I'll do some things virtually. I'll talk about a topic I really like. And, uh, sometimes I'll tutor. But for the most part, I haven't done that in a while now, and I miss it. I don't want to get back into it. For hobbies, uh, well, chasing my toddler around takes up a lot of my time, I must admit. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll, I'll go hiking through these hills. I'll go rock climbing, things like that. And, of course, I'll read. I'll read as much as I get the chance to whenever I can sit down. Okay. Fiction, non-fiction, what you prefer? Oh, both. Uh, fiction. Uh, fic I've got to. Fiction nowadays has got to be a voice that I really like and I can go back to. So I'll sit down and I can go through one a novel super fast, just start to finish. I do. Cornwall is one of them. I quite like his stuff. Uh, I'll go through any genre as well. Uh, George R. R. Martin. I've just been done some of the Game of Thrones novels or Song of Ice and Fire. If you want to go that way. Too long, I thought. I, I got mixed up with the characters. That many characters in there, and I, they're getting killed off every other page. I got fed up with I them think, at one stage. I didn't get fully fed up with them. I, I get enthralled to it because I started off with the show. And so at that point, I have a point of reference ah, to yeah. keep going back to. Yeah. The, the problem with some authors, and I, I don't want to slander anybody, but I'll go with, I'll, I will lightly say Harry Turtle, though, because I used to read his Ultimate History books. Hmm. He would read, he would write a story from the point of view of about 37 characters. And you'll lose about twelve along the way. Yeah. At which point, by the end of the book, you just, I, I, you know, I, it was an interesting story, but I, I couldn't tell you what happened to this guy from point page one to page two. Uh, Michelle uh, Cobbett, she chose the brilliantly titled "Sex, Revenge, and Chocolate Cake" for a March Indie review on a Cobbett Literary Ride website. Have you connected at all with Michelle? Briefly, briefly. And yeah. um, when I heard that she had chosen this, and I, I saw that you guys speaking about it yeah, in, yeah. on the podcast, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, frankly, I was I was thrilled to have the exposure. Thank you for that. But uh, just even more thrilled that you guys liked the story because when I wrote this, uh, I write the light reads as pure entertainment, really. It's much fun for me to write as it is to read, and I just being able to have a little bit of playful fun with that. For Michelle, uh, I, we've only sent a few messages back and forth, but I will be keep watching her. I will keep watching her reviews as well, and I I hope to connect with her next week. We're doing her my profile on her on her webpage. Brilliant. So with you, I know we've talked about books and fiction and nonfiction, but with your teaching and traveling, have you have you tried or you thought about writing nonfiction? Yeah, oddly enough, no. That's the strange thing. Uh, there's again two parts of my brain. When I, when I think about something creative, I'll, I'll read a good history, I'll read a good story from history, something that just catches my fancy. And I'll think, okay, I can write a great short story about that, or I could write a great novel about that. And on the other side, I think, oh, I can write a great history lesson on that. And I can, I think about how I would present it up in front of a room. So I think it's just the way I'm wired. So whether I, if I'm going to put something down on the page, it's probably going to be more creative than it is going to be uh, informative that way. What's your cup of tea? What's your thing? What do you like? Reading I, I, I like fiction books, man, you know, and just dramas, detective type things and all that. But I also uh, like romantic comedies, believe it or not. <laughs> really? Yeah. So I've got a, a few good friends who are authors who write comedies, romance, and, you know, that sort of stuff. But I've also, well, yeah, comedy books on, on police tra dramas and detective series. Right. Few authors, and I just love that sort of thing. It's quite lighthearted, you know, and uh, Gina. easy read. Very Gina. easy read. Gina, Gina. of course. And there's yeah. another friend I've got mm. in um, Cambridge, Terry. Um, Ali McNamara, she's another oh. uh, author, but she's mainly romantic, um, not comedies, just romantic beachside, you know, 
novels yeah. and all that. And, you know, there's always a hero who's the fella, obviously, and they fall in love. You know, the usual romance story. Yeah. Yeah. But they're very easy reading. Sometimes that every now and again, I'll pick one up. She does one book a year. I'll buy it. And I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of them you could read when you're away on the beach and it's, you know, you've got distractions all over because it's noisy and it's dead yeah. easy to read dead quickly, you know, yeah. simple. It's it's like comfort food. It's just something yeah. that you enjoy and you can get yeah. through. What's something wrong with that? That's it. Yeah. yeah. Um, Russell, tell us about the light read short stories and according to your excellent website, russellbarry.com, uh, a soon to be released full length novel, The Wickedest yes. of Things. The wickedest of Things. So that's that's the novel that really came to me mounted on that tractor in Australia. Just <laughs> yeah. my favorite, my favorite kind of thriller and or adventure novel was the kind where you establish a bunch of characters and then you you lock these people that you know and vivid people in a room and with a threat and they have to talk their way and work their way through it and that's basically what I did uh, for this one it's um, it's a novel basically where we throw people into a maze and they're working through different challenges to escape it, it's it's very minotaur esque yeah so it's that kind of thing that I really like to get into also, the same thing with that is, and with the light reads, is I never like writing naked villains, just the sort of p- person who's a bad guy purely because they are supposed to be a bad guy. Yeah. I'll make a cruel, I'm going to yeah. make a cruel yeah. and tough decision just because that's how I'm supposed to be. Yeah. That never seems interesting to me. It never has the, the flesh and backstory as it should, as it should, just to make it interesting. So uh, being able to write the villain in that story is someone who's, not just not just sympathetic, but understandable for what's happening. You yeah. you even feel for the villain a little bit. Yeah, three dimensional. Sort of but people say that about the uh, the, the Hannibal Lecter character. Some people, you know, even though he's sort of this despicable sort of monster, he does have a backstory. You know, where his sister was eaten by the the Nazis in Germany and mm. things. And there is elements of sympathy for him, and maybe an element of him being the underdog as well. See, that's the whole thing. It's the motivation where you see these this person doing reprehensible things yeah. and you don't forgive them for it. But in the back of your head, there's a little voice that just says, yeah, I understand how he got from, from where he was to this. Yeah. I, can, I can't justify it, but I can, I can rationalize it. You relate rationalization to it. is a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, true. Yeah. One of the, one of, for the light reads, actually, uh, this is... They're supposed to be really... Their entertainment is what I'm looking for for them. I want to write a bunch of short stories where they're just fun for the reader to get through. They can escape into them a little bit. And I hate to say it, but I can have a little fun as well. Hmm. Introducing people to my writing and uh, giving me a chance to explore different concepts. Uh, when we talk about sex, revenge, and chocolate cake, yeah. what I really wanted to do with that was write it from the point of view of a narr- narrator who is fundamentally unlikable. As you read into this book, I mean, he starts off by he's he's going he, he goes to this chocolate shop uh, on a wedding cake tasting for his wedding, and he's already <laughs> eye, he's already eyeing up the the <laughs> chef and the waitresses. Oh, yeah. she's pretty. Okay, just, <laughs> just what, what depth of, of immorality and depravity is this? I mean, you you look at this guy and just okay, I instantly think this guy is scum. You go with him <laughs> through the rest of this story yeah. and maybe you don't sympathize with him, but you, at the end of it, you're thinking, okay, I want, I want this central character in the story to get some comeuppance. I don't want him to die. I want him to just be taken down a peg or two. Yeah. That sort of fun is really good to put in the page. Short stories are wonderful in the fact that you can do things that we don't not, don't necessarily trend, uh, work as easily in a full novel. Making your narrator fundamentally unlikable would be an absolute slog if you're going through a 300-page novel. Yeah. I don't know if I can keep doing this. Yeah. But in a short yeah. story, you can take it to wherever you like as long as you have fun. And that's what I like to do on a page. Okay. Fair enough. But you've gone, I believe you've gone down, or it looks like you've gone down the road of uh, indie publishing, independent publishing. Um 
did you have a look at being published and did you find it a slog, hard work, impossible almost, and go to, and, and decide to go indie or have you have you still pushing for trying to find a publisher? I think everybody wants to have that official yeah, well. recognition of <laughs> yeah. being published one of the big five or something like that. Yeah. To be able to go that way. I, I tried for a while, but at the same time, and what I discovered is you know, publishing bit the publishing business is at, at its heart of business. I mean, it's about art, but it's also about being able to move books off shelves. And I started finding that the responses I was getting, and I, I put in oh, 100 submissions, 120 wow. to different agents and publishers and going through things. And some were positive, but there was always caveats and things like that. Well, I, I really like the story, but you see, this is, you know, this it's this many words long and we can only publish a story which is shorter because of production costs. So I need you to cut 30,000 words. I think you could do that. Uh, that's that's a steep thing. Okay, mm. it's maybe. Mm. Or another thing that I discovered and we were talking about, you know, Twitter and public pub publicity this way. Someone said to me, okay, well, again, I like, I like the story, but what I need you to do is we need you to have at least 75,000, maybe 85,000 followers on, on, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, all these sort of yeah. things. So we've established a market. Yeah. We, you, we know that we have a basis to work with, with you. That's what about impossible. the book itself? Don't you care about the book? Well, we do, but you know, we need something else to go on. It's it's a touch discouraging when you get through that, but again, publishing nowadays is as much about the story you want to tell as your story. So you have to have some angle to be able to market yourself to. Bit of a catch twenty two though, isn't it? I mean, if the the mm, books themselves way. were successful, then you're more likely to easily achieve the high number of Twitter followers. Your, your Twitter accounts, you got decent following numbers anyway. I'm fifteen thousand, yeah. which is. In the Twitter universe, is it's it's okay. It's not great. So, but... Yeah, it's not too shabby at all, is it? No, no. <laughs> but, yeah, but they're asking for what? They want you to have 60,000, 70,000 followers, and it's like, yeah. it's not everybody's cup of tea, is it? They no. don't want to do that on Twitter or Facebook. Full time, that would yeah. be good, not it? What are you working on at the moment? Is the wicked oh, of things... Yeah. That's what it was, uh, yeah. Is, is that a standalone or maybe the start of a, a series? I wrote it as a, st a standalone to start with. I just wanted to. It's. I'd written little novels before novellas, but I wanted to see if I could do the epic novel, and I, I think I did. But I wrote it as a standalone, but of course, as soon as you're writing something, then you're three quarters of the way through it, and you think, oh, I, I know where we can go from here. I, I, I want to <laughs> see. I want to see how this plays out in the next novel. I want to see how this can go. Yeah. So. Right now, I'm honestly working on an. Uh, I finished Wickedest of Things. I'm yeah. doing the last editing, and I'm going to get it um, officially in um, in paperback and in ebook probably by in the next two weeks. Brilliant. Got the cover and everything good to go. But what I'm working on right now is I've done another thriller, which I'm working on called The White Noise of Ashes. Well, great title. So I, I like yeah. that one too. So. Oh. It's the rest of it I got to work on. The title's great. So we'll have to see how that goes. <laughs> the yeah, the title's awesome. I love it. Yeah. As for as for the wickedest, uh, again, I know where I could take the story, but it's going to be a matter of uh, if I'm going to write it like that, then it would have to be some demand. If people like the book and they would, someone wants a sequel, then I'm happy to write it. Are you writing full time, and do you have um, a set routine? Like, you know, do you spend a certain time a day? Do you have a room in the house? Do you just do it as you go along, ad lib throughout the day? Do you have a word count per day? Or, you know, just explain you how, how that works well, for you. If I'm, when I'm going into writing, doing it full time, I have to do it as a job. I've got to approach it that way. So I've got, I've got a quota. I've got to do 850 words a day. And right. I, got a, I have a whiteboard taped to my fridge over there. So whenever I... So when my wife comes home at the end of the day, she can see that I've been working. <laughs> I can have that accomplishment saying, okay, I've done, yes, I've done 900 words today. And we're still well underway and I've done editing on these things. I've got a little office in the basement set aside. So I get up, have my tea, go down and just start working. If you do this, you take it seriously. So 
half of it is the writing and a lot of it's the marketing too. I spend a lot of time on Twitter and a lot of time on different websites trying to make sure you that my name is out there too. You can spend an awful lot of time on social media yeah. just trying to promote yourself, can't you? And I mean, I, I've been uh, doing it too. I've been a little trial over the past few weeks trying to increase my Twitter numbers because I've never really bothered with it before. <laughs> and I've been at it all the time just on the phone to try and get my numbers up. And that's nothing to do with an author or trying to promote a book or anything. Oh, wow. That's taking so much time. You know, it's, It is time consuming. Yeah. I, I only... I, I, I was never a social media guy. I never liked being on Facebook. I never liked being on, on Twitter. I never liked doing Instagram pictures. I'm clearly not pretty enough for Instagram. But the, <laughs> the whole thing about it, if you want to do something, you got to do it right. You've got to publicize. You've got to yeah. make sure yeah. you're well known. So that's been that. That's why I, I post about my, my toddler being about as easy to address as a Python on meth. <laughs> and that's funny. Yeah. just something that'll make people laugh during the day and keep that's it interesting. to build up followers yeah you mentioned editing are you doing the editing yourself are you giving this to a fresh pair of eyes are you giving it to your wife for instance to run over um Good my point. wife yes i've had her go over it but um i honestly uh, for my own work i tend to, to edit it and just pass it through a couple of different hands for the wickedest yeah. of things i went and hired a professional editor to go through it. Oh, okay yeah so if we're going to do it in a novel i want to make sure it's done right yeah. and I got back all the notes you did, but uh, unfortunately, I now have to translate them onto the page and mm -hmm. fix and fix what was done before, rather than handwritten. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, it's all part of the game. Hopefully, I'm going to have this done. Well, editing anyway-wise, by the end of the day, I want to get the rest of thing going. Um. So finally, from me then, what, yeah. what advice would you have for someone who's writing a book for the first time, and the best way to approach it? <laughs> I know considering we've talked about, you know, independent publishing and bits and pieces and how you do yours in your basement mm. and you're so many words a day. What would you say to a, a new writer who's penning a new book or his first book or her first book? Well, for a new for a new writer, first of all, think your book through. Think about it the way you would in any situation. Put your put yourself in the character's shoes to make sure that the decision they make is plausible. You can justify every decision and you don't have to think it to, to double think yourself that way. In, for writing, sit down and do it and just have, have faith that someone wants to read what you're putting on the page because someone will. I promise you that. You can't wait until someone for someone else to decide, okay, you can be a writer. Just do it. Just do it yourself and make that choice. Excellent yeah, advice. Sounds like uh, good advice. Good. Yeah. But on that note, Russell, um, our time's caught up with us. But it's been an absolute uh, joy to chat with you. And let's keep in touch. Great talking to you guys. Yes. Yeah, maybe it's maybe been very another interesting, one. Yeah, it yeah. has. Maybe another chat when yeah. uh, the Wicked yeah. Things comes out. I would love that, guys. Absolutely. Brilliant. I will I will hound you mercilessly as soon as it's available <laughs> so you can look at it. <laughs> oh, brilliant. But but, but for now, Russell. Quite amazing, I mean. It's quite amazing how many people do come back and hound us and say, yeah, can we have yeah. another chat? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really good for us to you. hear, though, you know. It's <laughs> it great. Is. Yeah. We'll do it's right. enjoyable for us as well, because we make it lighthearted. As we yeah. know. It's not like a grilling, and we're not trying to delve into your yeah. past or, you know, <laughs> your, your closet. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good stuff. Yeah. It is, it, it is, is. Yeah. yeah, but for Russell, you take care, and bye for now. Take care, guys. Yeah, Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much, you. Russell. Yeah. Cheers.